Well, uh, first, a big thank you to whoever was responsible that I'm here. And uh, I think it's really an exceptional event. Um, so I will be talking about theory and actually experiments, but actually in that order. So the theory in all these cases was first, and then subsequently we were so excited to actually try to see phenomena in the experiments. But first I would like to thank um, several people. Some of them are here. <laughs> um, so this is my group, nobody is here in, uh, in, in Dublin. Then <coughs> what I'm going to talk about, spin currents that actually grew out of things which we started with uh, Daniel Loss and we struggled there, and I think about 20 years ago. Uh, and it's actually nice that these things somehow come up into, onto stage again. Uh, then more recent work which I did on skirmions, which was a Swedish uh, Hong Kong uh, collaboration and actually this whole field of topology and magnets has been covered and we were actually was nice enough that we also could it make it to the newsstand in the French and German editions of Scientific Americans and this is the more serious stuff. So um, I want to go back to something which uh, Burkhardt showed at the beginning as a motivation and uh, now not about information processing with magnons, but actually the very humble way we call our videos from the web. Okay, This is stored on these things which we all love and hate, uh, hard disk drives. And just I want to show you how that actually <coughs> evolved over the past 50 years here. So this is a six terabyte hard disk drive which you get on the shelf now. And at the beginning, you may wonder how it looked like. Actually very similar, but the scale was different. So this is a platter of a hard disk drive at the beginning with a lousy capa capacity of two kilobits per square inch. And actually, if you wanted to load an iTunes song onto a plane, you needed a forklift at that time <laughs> because it looked like this. Okay, <laughs> so that illustrates these eight orders of magnitude of evolution over the past 50 years. And now is really the point that we are struggling with physical questions. And that's, you see that if you look at the evolution over the past 30 years, if you extrapolate that, you see that the capacity actually doubles every 1.54 years, which is faster <coughs> than actually semiconductors. And if you extrapolate that straight line, you would have seen that in 2014, you would have had a capacity of one terabit per square inch. And that's actually already very tiny. And actually, we are now about there. So things are slowing down. And if you go 10 years into the future, it would be 10 nanometers squared. So no way we can just scale. So what is needed is new ideas, as you see here to the left. But nothing actually works yet. So heating up hard disks with lasers, that's things fail after a thousand hours or so. so we really need to have new ideas, and I think this is also a challenge for us. Okay? And as physicists, of course, you're fascinated by, I think, this workshop quite nicely illustrated. The first day was a bit more classical, except Daniel, I think, gave a quantum twist. <laughs> and then the second uh, day was a bit more was quantum spin systems. And, but actually, there was also the question about Bose-Einstein condensates and so on, and actually, I will return to that in the last part my talk. But anyway, so this you can describe with a classical theory. You go smaller and then when you eventually have something like atomic chains, you really need a quantum description. But this is just about two orders of magnitude here in scale, yet we switch between quantum and classical. So really there is a lot of room for really interesting phenomena and I think that's why we're all here. And what I want to do is <coughs> just simply actually connect these things. And you know, and we have seen that just in the first two lectures this morning, magnetism is a quantum phenomenon, right? We can't get around it. We need to go back to the Iraq equation. Yet, when it comes actually to the description, and I love to see the first equation of Allen <laughs> and that Lipschitz equation, that's actually how the engineers use things. So that's a t equals zero description. And then, of course, we know phase transitions, right? And these are descriptions which are disjoint, usually. And even when we discuss, we somehow fall into one of these attractors. Yet, we have experiments <laughs> in between. 
So what we really need to do is to find connections, and I want to illustrate something there, and which also historically for us, for Daniel and myself, and then with the neutron scatterers, was actually what, yeah, what brought us to insight into quantum thing. Then thermal fluctuations, that's now for data storage, that's important, I won't say a single word about that here. And it turns out that topology, <laughs> which is also somehow the <laughs> elephant in the room <laughs> now during these days, plays a very important role and it helps us to understand phenomena in these different areas. So uh, we focus on this right hand side, except that I start a little bit with topology, I think because it's a bit complementary to what has been said before. So at the beginning, actually, I will also say something about skirmions, the people in the audience who worked and we have heard something before. But actually, also here I will be complementary. I will say, tell you things which you do not normally hear in talks. So then the second part goes then to this emergence of chirality or spin currents. Uh, which I just mentioned before, and I emphasize there is no DMI there. Though there is nothing, there, nor is there a, a symmetry in the boundary conditions. This is just spontaneous emergence of chirality. And finally, uh, dipolar interaction in quantum spin systems. So dipolar interactions are not the bad and the ugly, as has been mentioned on Monday. <laughs> Actually, they can be really helpful. And I think this is an absolutely fantastic system to see many of these phenomena. So just to, I can flash this, you saw this before, uh, what I want to show is you can derive long Lifshitz equations from an action and the quantum action looks pretty much the same but there is one thing and we see enormous consequences of that, of that one <laughs> and I think Daniel in the context of spin tunneling has emphasized that and we then subsequently emphasized it for a field theory. Um, this one is really important and the energy which we are looking at is, you know, the sum of exchange and isotopy, whatever you want, right, including dipolar interactions. So that sets the stage of what I want to talk about. And uh, <coughs> so then, why do we care about topology? Then? We care about topology because the magnetization is a continuous vector living in continuous space, okay? And with respect to data storage, we are interested in the fact our configurations stable because we want to keep the bits and actually all of the proposals of the recent proposals go in that direction domain walls topological objects racetrack memories racetrack memories of skirmions and so forth so and then finally of course we also want to write things <laughs> so we want to know what can we actually easily transform into each other and so this thing of continuous deformation is central and this is something which you probably have seen, you know, your breakfast table, you're a bit dizzy. Uh, so you're not quite sure whether the cup transforms into a donut or vice versa. And uh, so the two are obviously equivalent. Uh, but another object on the breakfast table is not, right? And that's the orange because you would have to punch a hole into the orange to transform it into a donut. So, um, then in magnetism you don't deal with cups and donuts and oranges, but you deal with circles, with n-spheres in general. So in real space you actually map a one-sphere to a one-sphere, that's the simplest example, and we can have vortices, right, where the phase winds around, and that actually, if it winds around once, we have a winding number of one, and quite generally we can characterize these things by winding numbers which are integers. Okay, so now we can actually have mappings which are non-trivial between spheres of any dimension. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, two spheres which turn out to be important just in a second and zero-dimensional spheres. Zero-dimensional sphere is actually an easing spin. Okay, the configuration space of an easing spin is a zero-dimensional sphere and that actually just tells us whether we do have a domain wall or whether we don't have a domain wall. So up-up or up-down. So, uh, and now these winding numbers take us where we actually want to be. It, it, it sort of tells us whether we are, can easily transform one configuration into another one. Whereas if we change the winding number, we do something at the sample edges, or you know, we have to think about it. So, uh, <laughs> so. <coughs> okay, um, now a vortex 
you all know this, I just want to repeat that. Uh, we identify this object because we can go around it, we see a phase change and circles of ever decreasing diameters, and if we keep the spin in plane, then actually the spin doesn't know in which direction to point. So actually the order parameter is zero. So that's a singular point defect. And in that sense, we have many defects, okay? We can actually put them into this, into this grid. We have domain walls of zero dimensions. We have domain walls in a film, which is a one-dimensional object, or a wall in a three-dimensional sample, or a vortex in a film, or actually a vortex line in a 3D bulk system, or a hedgehog for a spherical spin. And we actually can, uh, with, and the degree that's just, don't want to go into details, uh, um, but you actually have the dimensions of the defect, you can relate to the dimension of the order parameter space and the dimension of real space. This has mainly been known in the context of liquid crystals already, so nothing new, or not so much new, uh, but of course we give it different names in magnetism. Now in magnetism we also have other, these, these defects are characterized by the fact that magnetization is zero at the location of the defect. Okay? But now we also have continuous defects, such as a 2 pi domain, right? And we have seen that before. That's sort of a paradigmatic uh, example for a topo smooth topological defect. What do I mean by that? Because if you actually walk along the domain wall, then you, um, you wind around once, and so you actually have a winding number of one. So, now, how does that relate to mapping a circle to a circle? Well, you need to transform the line into a circle, and you do that via stereographic projection, which you can do as long as the spins are parallel at infinity. Um, so you do it like this, and so this has a binding number one, and we actually come back to that in a second. So stereographic projection, that smells of a map. So in two dimensions, if we do the same procedure in two dimensions, well, we arrive at our uh, famous object, which is the skirmion, because we, if we project it stereographically, we create this hedgehog on a sphere, and this hedgehog, we cannot really transform into something where all the spins are parallel without tearing the spin texture in a discontinuous fashion. Okay, so um, now that's just, uh, I think you all know that, but now I want to say the untold things. So how can we actually stabilize these skirmions? Um, and so there have been a few things and points of view in the literature, okay, it was fast, uh, and I want to put that into perspective. And one of the nice things is if you, you know, use analytical tools, uh, sometimes you stumble across surprising connections, and one of them is that if you look at the profile of a 2 pi domain wall, which is there, which is actually known analytically, then it describes experiments extremely well. This is an experiment here from the Hamburg group here a while ago, and it really, this profile here, describes this evolution in its external field very well. So, <coughs> but this profile also describes the radial dependence within a skirmion very well, okay? So, in a certain sense, this is like a Swiss army knife, <laughs> you, know, you can use it for a 2 pi domain wall and you can use it for a skirmion. So this is now this ansatz superimposed to the original numerical solutions of Bogdanov in 94. Incidentally, the two things appeared in 94, <laughs> right? This analytical solution and his numerical work. So with two parameters you can fit all of their numerical results. That motivates us to actually use this as a variational ansatz. And so what we do is we can actually insert this into our energies, as I described that, which is here. And then what we see, we immediately get the field dependence of a skirmion radius. Okay, so that's there. And what we see, and that's now somehow <laughs> Interesting because there are many people who say, okay, a skirmion is only stabilized by DMI, but actually dipolar interactions are always there. You cannot switch them off. Okay? And you see that DMI and the dipolar interaction at the formal level, they enter in a completely symmetric way. Of course, when you actually go to a system, then the dipolar interaction is sometimes smaller, but it may have the effect of actually raising D above the critical value, 
such that you actually have skirmions in your particular system. Okay, so uh, so both dipolar interactions and chalorzynski maria interaction contribute to the skirmions stabilization. All the quantities that you have are dimensionless um, quantities. Benjamin, so yeah, I the conventional wisdom was that. Uh, it's the bubbles, like really large skirmions. <laughs> no, no, that this is that, that just look at this, right? Okay, <laughs> so this is the experiment in uh, in the Hamburg group, right? So they are small. So the dipole interaction there is not negligible, okay? So if I actually insert everything, I get this. And actually, I mean, when you see this, you say, well, something is wrong, right? The agreement is so good, okay? And actually, um, if you look at, you see. This is 0.2, okay, this is 1.3, so it is smaller, but if it is 0.9, actually, it, you know, exactly raises you above the critical value, right, of one. And that's the point which I would like to make. What is the material uh, Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's like, it's extreme, it's like, um, I think, bilayer or so, so it's really, really tiny. Like right. um, yeah, it's iron on platinum, ah. I think, yeah, so I think so, yeah. Um, so, um, but what you see is that, as a matter of principle, you know, both enter in the same way, and it's a particular situation which tells you, you know, what is actually more important and what actually is responsible for the stabilization. Now, there is a, okay, so to summarize, so that's what you actually just said, right? The conventional wisdom is, okay, we have bubbles, they're usually large, right? We have DMI skirmions, they're really tiny and therefore suitable for information storage, but actually, we really need to look at the whole thing, okay? Now, there is another way, and that's another sort of not conventional thing, is another way to stabilize a skirmion, okay? And um, there is, namely, um, you can do that dynamically, okay? And I wanna show you how that works. So first, a movie, because you get sort of a flavor of that. So the skirmion, the spins precess, the skirmion breathes, and interestingly, you do not need DMI, you do not need dipolar interaction. This is a purely dynamical object, okay? So, which of course then, if you're actually able to do dynamics in experiments, unfortunately, experimentalists are all gone, they're nearly gone. <laughs> so, um, um, that is actually gives a, a completely new way. So, no, you <laughs> so, um, Okay. Uh, now, can we actually propose a specific setup to see that? And that's actually one setup, and I think there are others as well. This is just one thing which we have been thinking about. This is the lambda initiative equation together with a spin torque and damping. Okay, so you have a nano contact, you inject the spin current, and you get out your Swiss Army knife again and stick it into your equations of motion. And what you actually get is a very simple system of two differential equations. And now this is really, really simple, okay? So, and F here, um, so sigma is the, is the current, um, F essentially encodes all contributions which violate angular momentum conservation, okay? Uh, they could all be zero, right? So this is damping and this is the driving spin current. Now, as you see, you get non-trivial solution if you put literally everything to zero on the right-hand side here which is in color, including the F, okay? You actually get just a precessing skirmion with a constant radius, it's not breathing, okay? So again, you have these dimensionless parameters, and um, so now you can actually put some understanding behind the notion which you find that, you know, a spin current can actually undo damping, right? Okay, so on the left is now, I put everything to zero, as I just said, except the choloshinsky maria interaction, and you see the radius of the skirmion oscillating, and you see the angle precessing, okay? Now, I switch on both damping and the spin torque, looks the same, okay? So the spin torque really undoes <laughs> the damping. Okay, and you can stabilize this beast in a nanocontact. So far, I uh, haven't heard of any convincing observation, but it's not, you know, I think many, many groups are working on it. So um, now, so you have a dissipation-less medium in a nanocontact, 
And what you also can do, you can generate skirmions underneath a nanocontact and shuttle them through a DMI-free material. Okay. No need for DMI, right? As long as it is dynamic. So you just apply an in-plane current, and that's a simulation with realistic parameters, and you then just let it shuttle into a second nanocontact where you charge it up again. Okay. So I think this is kind of very interesting, and it opens up many more avenues than actually have been explored so far. So now I switch gears, go into the quantum world, I announced it. And so you expect it already at this point, I sort of ask this heretic question, is DMI really necessary for chirality? And as you expect, it is not, okay? So, um, and actually it is really a feature, it is a consequence of quantum fluctuations and I want to show you that at all levels. Um, and I want to show you how actually to measure that, you can measure that. <coughs> so, just I want to actually go back to what we said before. Chirality is related to this S1 winding number, okay? Uh, because a domain wall, as you know, in an easy axis magnet winds and goes from up to, um, from, from down to up or vice versa. And the winding sense, and actually Jaroslav described that Monday nicely, and I think uh, you were not so happy with this uh, zero degree of freedom of the charge, right? <laughs> Which tel tells you actually how you respond to an applied field, for example. So, so you have two topological charges associated with a domain wall, which is the charge, well, as we called it, we called it the charge, and we called that um, the handedness, the chirality. And that's related to this um, winding number. So, now to put it into a nutshell, <laughs> so you s well, that was not so good, this nutshell. <laughs> uh, yeah, back to this issue of chirality. So we know that domain walls at a nanometer scale are chiral. Yet in an easing system, there is no chiral degree of freedom. There is just really this S0 charge. Right? So where does it come from? Okay. And one way to understand it is actually to look at, uh, so this is chiral, this is a chiral, which is clear, is to, one, to look at one of the fruit flies of low dimensional magnetism. I mean, we are by no means the first ones to look at such a thing. It has been investigated very well, characterized very well. As you saw yesterday with Christian Rieck's talk, um, these are chains of cobalt atoms. Uh, above the nail temperature, you have essentially a bunch of uncoupled chains. So you explore the one-dimensional physics. And um, so in this case, I write it now, unlike um, some of the people yesterday, I don't use a delta. I use explicitly JZ, JT, for reasons which you will see. Um, <coughs> so you have an easing term and you have an XY term. And actually the XY term, sorry that was a bit fast, is much smaller than the easing term. So you just add a little bit of quantum fluctuations to the easing system. So just actually to remind you of a few things of spin chains. So magnons are no longer the good quantities. You should not talk about magnons. And th the reason is the following, because if you flip a cluster of spins, you always have two domain walls. And that's actually the basic entity, okay? Because all those states are degenerate. So you shouldn't really be talking about this bound state of two domain walls, but actually of freely moving, uh, yeah, of freely moving domain walls. And it's actually the XY term which drives those around. Now, and that's now what we saw more than 20 years ago, actually on a rather <laughs> curvy detour, <laughs> but in a, <laughs> in a nutshell. So we saw this dispersion, that's cosine 2K. So you think, okay, this is an antiferromagnet having of the Brillouin zone and end of story. No, it isn't, because the same thing happens for ferromagnets as well. So it is not a magnon dispersion, it looks like this. And actually, if you look at the eigenstates carefully, you find that these band minima are not equivalent, they have a handedness. Okay. They're degenerate. So this is sort of a K dependent generalization of the Kramers theorem. You have a degeneracy and you have a, and you know it, I think Daniel showed it with a triangle. This is sort of most elementary manifestation on a triangle. You can have the two chiral states which are degenerate. So, um, okay, now <laughs> the story <laughs> unfolds uh, because we entered a discussion which went to the 
board of you know PRL, and as it happens. And um, so we got into arguments with Tony Leckett, which extended over weeks and day and night and 10 emails a day or more. It was intense. So, and ultimately, um, somehow the other side ran out of arguments and we <laughs> wrote the statements. And I bet a good bottle of wine, for example, Chateau Muto Rothschild. Incidentally, this is the better wine than we had yesterday. <laughs> um, that this cannot be measured. And so the heat was on. Okay. Um, okay, so next chapter, neutrons. So neutrons do not detect individual domain walls, as you know. They interact, they introduce spin flips, so they create pairs. And that is the reason why you have continua in neutron scattering, right? Because you have this internal relative degree of freedom. Now, what you also can do is, and that relates to many of the talks which also happen here, you can heat the sample, okay? If you heat the sample, you generate these domain walls here in this band, and you scatter them around, okay? So, that is here, and uh, that's actually very focused. That's where we did our experiments in this regime simply for yeah, many reasons. We also did them here, but here actually the theory is sort of more clear cut than in the other case. So uh, first we actually just wanted to see whether the sample behaves as we thought. So that's what you expect in theory. This is the temperature, this is the energy. So as a function of temperature, you get this response if you, ex if you scatter a domain wall from a band minimum to a band maximum. Okay, so that's essentially this bump here, okay? And of course, at low temperatures, you don't have them to start with. So, and that's the experiment. So that looks fairly nice, but it doesn't tell us yet anything about chirality and spin currents. For that, we have to use polarized neutrons. And polarized neutrons couple in this way to the spin configuration, which is not something which you normally find, sort of a subtle thing, but the Russians did a lot on that. So that's just the experimental setup. But now that nearly everybody is gone from <laughs> that department. <laughs> um, that's okay. So now if you look at the cross-section, the difference here, you find that actually if you scatter close to the band minimum, you indeed get a contribution of minus one here. So this sign here is actually minus one. So close to the maximum at zero here, it's plus one. So in principle, this is good news but only in principle, because you have that sum. So you sum over all equivalent momentum and energy transfers, and the whole thing averages out to zero. And that is the reason why nobody has seen this. Okay. It's like a, a solution of chiral molecules, left-handed and right-handed, with the same concentration. You don't see any optical activity. So really, you need to think. Or, more likely, go jogging in Grenoble. <laughs> and so they have some idea, and the idea is to apply a transverse field. Now, a transverse field in this XXZ model, this is actually no longer exactly solvable because it's a transverse field, um, but in perturbations here you can, uh, actually has the effect not of splitting, but actually of deforming the band. And that then removes the degeneracy between transitions out of these minima. And that's now really the big thing to see with polarized neutrons. So are we able to see that? Well, not. And actually, it was a struggle. I mean, several failed uh, magnets <laughs> and years have passed. Finally, we were able to see it. But it was really at the limit of statistics because polarized neutrons, and this is the most intense source in the year. Yeah, well, OK. <laughs> some, some power gap. But you should not interrupt me now because the thing is actually relevant <laughs> which I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and actually, this constitutes the first detection, really, of a spin current in an antiferromagnet, a pure spin current. Okay? And this is something which came up yesterday and I have to actually, no, I should skip this uh, because we don't really have so much time. Um, and so, okay, so this is the summary. Um, this is the main wall, quantum fluctuations move it, you get a band, you get band minima, they are chiral. And the spin current restricted to the lowest soliton subspace is actually conserved. So this 
domain wall here you can actually interpret as a state with two spin currents backward and forward. And there is no DMI present. Okay? So now to the last part, and that's now also answers a question which has been raised in Hong Kong a year ago. Um, so do we actually have magnets with large spins which show quantum behavior? Okay. And um, uh, that's just a joke. Uh, <laughs> people are wondering actually in Arizona what the vortex is. So this is in this new age place, Sedona. And I found that on a, on a door. You know. So what is a vortex? Seems to be a very, <laughs> very important <laughs> question. And it actually takes us back right into the center of you know, issues which we have here. Namely, how do we go from a classical spin to a quantum spin? Okay. The answer lies in something which Alan described before, and that is the Berry phase. And the Berry phase, you can write this. Okay, and you recognize this term again, which I showed you at the beginning, and it's spin times the area. And here again, I think I just jumped through this. This is formal stuff. That was just there to make it uh, closer to what Alan said before. So eventually what we can do is we can write down an action for an easy plane spin in an external field, which is the object which was discussed extensively on Monday. <coughs> so this is the action, okay? And now we put the action here. Um, we can actually put that, the action into action and integrate out the out of easy plane degrees of freedom. And what we end up is this very simple effective action, okay? And this is a theta function here, you know, which also pops up in string theory. And actually, we can write down the expectation value of the spin for all temperatures. So this is a closed expression for all temperatures. We see actually how a quantum magnet somehow transforms into a classical power magnet. OK, so and that analogy to the flux through the charge orbiting the flux quantum is such that a half integer spin corresponds to a charge orbiting <coughs> a flux line which has half in tetraflux and um, in tetraflux. Okay, so that's now theory and now experiments in the last three minutes. So actually if you tune this with the external field you get the usual physics sawtooth dependence different for half in tetraspin and in tetraspin. Okay, so system <coughs> is this. This is the crystal. You shouldn't actually put it into air because it decays, so you have to operate it on the vacuum. This is looking inside this crystal. This is erbium, and erbium has a large spin. So is erbium now a classical spin or a quantum spin? And um, so if we do Newton diffraction at really low temperatures, we find a two-dimensional ordering. So we have effectively planes, so we have a two-dimensional system even though we have a three-dimensional crystal. So the crystal decouples, right? into planes. So, and this is one third of ordering, which corresponds sketchy to this type of ordering, which I have there. And now, dipolar magnets are not that ugly, okay? <laughs> Actually beautiful. This is now dipoles on a honeycomb magnet. The ground state has a continuous degeneracy, which is not like that of a ferromagnet, but sort of like an optical mode. Okay, so the spins rotate in opposite directions on the two sublattices. So now going into the crystal fields, of course, we have quantum levels. And we can do that, we can calculate something, but more importantly, actually, we can do the experiment. So this is crystal field levels measured with neutrons. We can extract, somehow predict the evolution of the levels with a field. And you see that it sort of uh, resembles <laughs> what you've seen before. Okay. And that's the actual experiment. Okay. So, what is actually happening? So, what is actually happening is at zero field, you have ordering, one third, one third. You raise the field, you lose the magnetic ordering. You raise it again, you get it back, and then you lose it again. Okay. So, we do not have, and that feeds now back into your talk before. Uh, this is not just a canting anti-ferromagnet or any type of magnet, it's a dipolar magnet. But this is a magnet which undergoes quantized, quantized steps. So really, large spins are quantum too. 
And you have to remember that in the context of spin eyes, which we quickly have seen that, you know, normally you describe them with classical spins. So, okay, now we can look at the specific heat, actually a zero field. And what we see is the specific heat of a two plus one dimensional XY model. It's consistent with a two plus one dimensional XY model. The one dimension tells us that we are dealing with a quantum system. If we lose the magnetic order, we just have nothing, we just have Schottky slope. And that tells us that, you know, this, we didn't somehow lose this peak because it moved around in a Brillouin zone, you really have nothing. And that reflects the levels, and then, now I'm finished. Um, so, now, effective action of a dipolar magnet looks like this. Effective action of a bose hubbard model <laughs> looks like that. So, what's the difference? Okay, well, the difference is we have here the dipolar interaction, here we have a ne nearest neighbor, but that's not really relevant. So, really, we are back to this bose and hubbard model directly, and we know now actually what's going on. Because the field plays the role of the chemical potential of the bosons. And if we go through this thing at the cut, we have the superfluid phase, the gapped phase, the superfluid phase, and the gapped phase. So, what does the experiment tell us? I mean, that's es essentially what, what, the, sorry, what the experiment tells us, but now what about the temperature dependence? Okay, this is a bit slow. The temperature dependence is, okay. <laughs> this, okay, so I ac add an extra axis, and we are at the fixed coupling strength. We expect this, and the experiment looks this. So I think with this I want to conclude. So this is a system, this is a quantum magnet, which, you know, it walks like a duck, it quakes <laughs> like a duck, so it is a duck. It has all the hallmarks of a bose hubbard model, okay? And um, so actually I can skip that and uh, yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>